Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of the earth, there's no way to measure what you're Lay behind a stone You live to die Rejected and alone Like a rose Trampled on the ground You took the fall And thought of me Above all
Well, good morning, cyber worshippers. Sounds a bit like an episode of Doctor Who, really, doesn't it? Wherever you're watching us from, the lounge or the bedroom, Litchfield or London, England or abroad, you are most welcome. We're all separated physically, but we can come together virtually as we worship God with all creation and with angels, archangels and all the company of heaven. Uh, if you're new to this, maybe you've just uh, stumbled upon us while you were rummaging around in YouTube, or a friend maybe has said it might be worth looking into, or you might even be part of another church that uh, isn't providing any services at the moment. We hope wherever you are, whoever you are, you'll feel part of what's going on. So there's no need to wonder whether to stand up or sit down, or to worry that you're in someone else's seat this morning. No one's going to stare at you if you don't join in the hymns or wonder why you're sitting there in your pyjamas. Just relax where you are and try to sense the presence of God with you for these few minutes this morning. As always, we're very grateful to Colin Bridle and James Cresswell for putting all this together and to the various people who've taken part by reading or leading our prayers or providing our music. And after the service, you can join us for a cup of fairly traded in the virtual Litchfield room. Don't do what you normally do and just go through the door on the left or you might end up in the utility room or the downstairs toilet this morning. But there should be some details on our Facebook page of how to join in with that. Now, I just need to say that we're recording this on a Thursday afternoon. So if there's something that's happened between then and now that doesn't get a mention that you expect, many apologies. As we prepare to worship, Let's just acknowledge that we're not alone in this this morning. Wave at the screen and imagine everyone else waving back. If you're one of those people who doesn't like such ostentatious demonstrations of bonhomie, please look away now. So let's worship together, believing that God will meet with us this morning and in some way touch our lives by the power of his Holy Spirit. We're going to begin with some words from the Psalms. Please join in these responses with me, if you would say the second line of each couplet. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. And from a song written in the distant past to a song that is a bit more contemporary, join in and sing along now as we praise our powerful God together with all that he has made. Praise him, you heavens.
Now, each week we get a little glimpse into the world of some members of the congregation who sent in some of their reasons to be cheerful, some items of thanks and praise during this weird time of separation and isolation. Um, before we pray together, we just can have a quick look together at some of the things that have been sent in this week, both videos and photographs and other little snippets of news and thanks. Hi, I'm currently out on one of my walks, trying to go out daily. I'm really thankful that we can still do this and I just had a day of work. Um, this is week six, working from home for me and I'm just really grateful that I can still do that. Um, thankful for this beautiful countryside that we can walk in and actually enjoy it. It's very rare that I've been out for a walk around here and I've been trying to do it every day since lockdown. I'm just thankful for the blue sky and the nature and the sun shining. Um, just thankful for uh, my house group and that we can connect with each other every week. Um, and I'm also really enjoying having virtual dinner with my parents most evenings and that's just been really lovely as well. So I hope everyone's uh, keeping well and hopefully we'll all meet in the virtual tea and coffee room after the service. Hope to see you then. This is Sid the Sloth from the movie Ice Age, and we're about to do this new dance, the Continental Drift. It's time to get up on your feet. It's easy to do. Just follow me. Move it out. Do the sit. Take it back. And do the sit. Step left. Then drift. Step right. And then drift. Crisscross. And do the man-made. Crisscross. And do the man-made. Now jump, jump, wiggle your arm. Now just hold some of those words and images in your mind now and maybe add to them any that, of the things in your own mind that we're grateful to God for this morning. So I'm going to lead us in a prayer and then we'll all join together where we are in the words of the Lord's Prayer and the words will be on the screen if you need them. Let's pray. God of power and might, God of tenderness and compassion, we come before you this morning in our scattered situations and offer you our thanks and praise for all your goodness to us. Although life is very strange for us at the moment and we're having to get used to some unusual ways of doing things, we thank you that you are always there, always unchanging, always reliable. Thank you for providing for our needs, that we still have the food and drink we need. There's still a basic infrastructure to our life together. Our bins are emptied, our water flows, our mass media still work to inform us and entertain us, our health service is still operating, our schools, colleges and universities are still in different ways providing education. Thank you for opportunities for exercising indoors and out, for good weather and for much needed rain, for social media to keep in touch with each other, for books and films and music for memories to sustain us and for hope to encourage us. Thank you for your presence with us when things aren't going well, as well as when all seems peaceful and pleasant. We thank you for this time together 
Receive our disparate prayers and praise, our dislocated songs and worship, and speak to us all through what we do here now. And may these few minutes change us in some small way today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen. So as always, let's give a birthday shout out for those who are celebrating at the moment, especially for those who are having to celebrate alone. Uh, it's Lewis Neal's birthday this coming week. We wish him a very happy birthday. And also Marilyn Maguire's had a birthday in the last couple of days. Uh, this very day, uh, Pam Hayter is 93. We wish her a very happy birthday. And last week, uh, Rick and Anne Hill celebrated their 40th wedding anniversary. So congratulations to you, Rick and Anne, and to anyone else who may be celebrating this week. May you know God's presence with you uh, in your celebrations together. We're going to take another opportunity to praise God together now as we sing a song of triumph and hope. A reminder that we worship the risen Lord Jesus Christ and we find our hope in him, whatever may be happening around us. And thanks again to Colin, who's arranged and played the music for all our songs, and to Sophia and Annabelle for giving us a vocal lead. So please join them, join us, wherever you are, as we sing, O oh, Praise the Name.
Well, these aren't strange days, aren't they? Despite all the speculation about when the current lockdown might end, we are still caught up in it. The familiar ways of doing things are, for most of us, just a distant memory or a forlorn hope at the moment. We're having to learn new skills, adopt new routines, cope with new roles. We have more time to kill, but some of us fewer activities to fill it. It's unsettling and disconcerting, especially for people who are already finding life difficult enough to deal with. And on top of all that, there is for many people a sense of fear, fear of the unknown, fear of the effects of this virus on ourselves and on our families and friends, fear of life without some of the conventions and boundaries that we normally take for granted. And for a growing number of people, there's grief to deal with as well. Not necessarily occasioned directly by the virus, but because of the way in which current restrictions have limited our capacity to support and console one another. It can seem a gloomy and joyless time, despite the efforts of many to try and jolly us along. And now, several weeks into this crisis, we're starting, some of us, to feel that very keenly. As uh, the lightning seeds once sang, I never realised the joy till the joy was gone. And I suppose it might be an even bigger issue for those of us who claim to follow Jesus, who call ourselves Christians, because we believe that joy is at the very heart of all that we're about. The angels who appeared in the sky above Bethlehem to those shepherds so many years ago were heard proclaiming good news of great joy that will be for all people. The coming of Jesus into our world was intended to bring joy to the world. The Christian life is intended to be a life of joy, a life that's worth living, a life which overflows with joyfulness that cannot be found elsewhere. And in times like this particularly, but at all times really, we're called to be people of joy. But that's sometimes easily forgotten. And we find a situation such as the current one for all of us and the different things that life throws for us as individuals it can seem to suck all the joy out of us. In the introduction to a book of those little quips and quirks about church life, that you find, you know, the bits of uh, new sheet bloopers and unfortunate phrases used by the preacher, odd epitaphs on gravestones and all that kind of stuff. In the introduction to a book called All Preachers Great and Small, the prologue includes this little snippet. Let me just read it to you. A man was commissioned to take a traffic survey at a busy intersection in one of America's major cities. He noted that people were thoroughly enjoying themselves and one another as they walked to church on Sunday mornings. However, they suddenly became rigid, formal, sober and quiet as they approached the door of the church. At the conclusion of the service, they came out of the building very piously and that was how they remained until they crossed the street, when they seemed to relax, to talk and to become more normal again. And one of the man's questions at the end of his task was, what goes on in churches that deprive people of all joy? Now that story may well be apocryphal, uh, I don't know. But I do know that most people who come along here on Sunday, when they can come, or who post stuff on the church Facebook page, seem to be fairly happy most of the time. But the popular view of Christianity in the in the wider community is often that we're a bunch of people who go out with long faces, we have a terribly serious outlook on life, uh, we sing dirge-like hymns accompanied by instruments you never find outside a church, and we spend more time stopping people having a good time than actually enjoying life ourselves. They think maybe of something like H.L. Mencken's uh, definition of Puritanism and assume that that's what Christianity is all about, the haunting fear that someone somewhere may be happy. A young child who'd been hearing about the call of the first disciples in Sunday school told his parents that Jesus' followers were told they would from now on be vicious old men. And I sometimes wonder if other people have maybe misheard that too. Now, of course, those who call themselves Christians have the same worries as everyone else. At the moment, the restrictions that we're under and the threat that we face from this illness make no distinction between people of faith and people of no faith. We're all equally affected by the possibility of economic problems and health concerns. 
We have the same emotions, we're confronted by the same te temptations, we experience the same grief and anxiety, we face the same restrictions as everyone else, simply because we're human. But we then feel we shouldn't. As we mentioned last week, if you were listening, we're Christians, we shouldn't have to go through this. And we start to wonder what it's all about, we start to feel maybe guilty that we're not leading the victorious life that some people are saying we should. We do start to lose the sense of joy and security that we thought we had. How are we supposed to cope with that? Well, let me tell you a little story. There was once a man who was a great intellectual. He had great gifts. He'd been trained by the leading figures in his field. That, that was law in his case. He had a wonderful career ahead of him. He had a number of real privileges and security in his job. And his background and upbringing actually conferred even more on him. But he was vehemently and violently anti-Christian. However, God broke into his life in a dramatic and unmistakable way. And in the end, he became a powerful preacher and evangelist, whose Christian wisdom and advice were of, of great help to an enormous number of people. And as he moved about preaching and teaching and proclaiming the love of God, he faced a good deal of opposition, both physically and emotionally. He was imprisoned. He was beaten up. He was chased out of communities. He was constantly in danger from those who opposed his message and his methods. Most of the time, he was able to live only on what kind hosts provided for him as he stayed with them on his various preaching tours. And on top of that, he had a painful and constant illness that caused him huge distress. Eventually, this preacher was arrested and imprisoned, firstly to be kept under close house arrest, then actually to be chained up to a guard 24 hours a day. Quite a change from the freedom of travel and preaching that he had once enjoyed. Now, we know all about this from contemporary historians and from a collection of his own letters, which he wrote during his travels and latterly during his captivity, during his lockdown. And through those accounts of others, and perhaps more especially through his own correspondence, we have a portrait of someone who never complained, but who was strangely actually able to enjoy life. In one of his last letters, written from his imprisonment in Ephesus in Turkey, he actually tells his correspondence, Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. And if you haven't already guessed, this man was St. Paul, the Apostle. And one of the letters he wrote from his solitary lockdown is the letter we now know as Philippians. It's part of our New Testament. And compared with Paul, when it comes to rejoicing, we're probably only beginners. This letter is a letter full of joy. And when you realise the circumstances under which it was written, that joy becomes even more wonderful. It's clear, just in that one brief quotation, rejoice in the Lord always, that Paul sees joy as something we're responsible for, not something that depends on our circumstances. A more recent quotation from the golfer Chip Beck puts it, as it were, from the other side. He said, pain and suffering are inevitable in our lives. After all, we're human, aren't we? Pain and suffering are inevitable in our lives, but misery is an option. Or more positively, uh, the Christian uh, thinker Bobby Moore wrote, Joy does not simply happen to us. We have to choose joy and keep choosing it every day. Now, Philippians is undoubtedly the most joyous letter in the New Testament. And Paul uses the actual word for joy no less than 19 times in its four short chapters. He seems to find opportunities for rejoicing in all kinds of things. And clearly his relationship with God enables him to deal with the very real problems that he's facing and to share something of the secret of that with others. So we're just going to listen to the, the first little section of it this morning. Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 to 11, if you want to follow in the Bible. And Anne Rushton is going to read that for us now. The reading is taken from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 1 verses 1 to 11. From Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's people in Philippi, 
who are in union with Christ Jesus, including the church leaders and helpers. May God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. I thank my God for you every time I think of you, and every time I pray for you all. I pray with joy because of the way in which you have helped me in the work of the Gospel from the very first day until now. And so I am sure that God, who began this good work in you, will carry it on until it is finished on the day of Christ Jesus. You are always in my heart. And so it is only right for me to feel as I do about you. For you have all shared with me in this privilege that God has given me, both now that I am in prison and also while I was free to defend the gospel and establish it firmly. God is my witness that I am telling the truth when I say that my deep feeling for you all comes from the heart of Christ Jesus himself. I pray that your love will keep on growing more and more, together with true knowledge and perfect judgment, so that you will be able to choose what is best. Then you will be free from all impurity and blame on the day of Christ. Your lives will be filled with truly good qualities which only Jesus Christ can produce for the glory and praise of God. So here's a man then who's not weighed down by trying, by struggling, by attempting to do his best all the time. Here's a man who's been through the kinds of circumstances most of us will never ever have to face and he's come out smiling. Here's a man who's had to cope with what he describes in one of his other letters as a thorn in the flesh for many years, despite his praying and pleading to God to heal him and help him. Now, I reckon he's someone we could learn a bit from. So that's what we're going to do over the next few Sunday mornings, although uh, next week uh, we'll be joining others in reflecting on the 75th anniversary of VE Day. But after that, we'll pick this up again. As we try to cope with our lockdown with the curtailment of our freedom. As we face the fears and anxieties that come with this virus, as we have to deal with separation from our loved ones, with grief, with uncertainty, with the kind of profound suffering that can only come from closed pubs and hairdressers. Let's reflect on Paul's experience and on his teaching in this letter so that we might be able to live our, our lives, our Christian lives, attractively as well as distinctively. And maybe the things we learn from this might stand us in good stead when this crisis has finally passed. Now, there'll be the, let me just say, there'll be the usual material for the house groups if you want to access that via the church website, and I'll include a few pointers towards further reading for those of you who'd like to follow it up. And as we go through, we'll fill in a little bit of the background too, discover that we can find basis for our joy in all kinds of places, all kinds of situations. And maybe by the time we finish this, we'll be able to meet together again in church rather than in cyberspace. But this morning, though, just a few general thoughts about joy and link that in with what Paul says here. What exactly is this joy? Well, firstly, what is it not? It's not just being happy. It's not just having that forced and pious grin that so many people think you need if you're a proper Christian. Nor is it a sense of humour or the ability to see the funny side of things, despite the many memes and so on that are posted on Facebook pages. It's not the shallow kind of happiness that can be quite overwhelming one day and have disappeared completely the next. It's not the pros prosperity gospel. See, there's no point Paul writing this letter if it's just a question of cheering them up. He might just as well have sent them a book of jokes, something like Marshall's epigrams or juvenile satires before the pedants point out, juvenile satires was actually published after Paul wrote this letter, so he couldn't have sent it to him anyway. I wouldn't want to waste several Sundays worth of sermons by trying to make you smile a bit more, or even just providing a bit of light relief. Uh, a Durham University teacher, William Morris, wrote a book called Joy in the New Testament, in which he identifies 11 different Greek words for joy that are used in our New Testament from words meaning optimism and hilarity 
through to gladness and exultant joy. And they're all quite different words in Greek and all have something different worth saying to us. And in this letter, this letter to the Philippians, Paul uses just three of those words. And on 14 of the 19 occasions he writes about it, he uses a word that means actually inward joy. So this isn't about jumping for joy or slapping people on the back and saying, what a wonderful time you're having, despite the fact you haven't been out of the house for five weeks. You've watched every episode of Columbo. The cheesy snacks have run out and the cat you thought was neutered has just had seven kittens. It's about knowing deep down that you're okay with God, that he's got his eye on you, even if things aren't going as smoothly as you'd like. It's an inner peace, if you like, that means you can be sure that God loves you and cares for you. In one of the many commentaries written on this letter, someone called Gerald Hawthorne, who's a professor of Greek, says that when Paul wrote about joy here, he was in reality describing a settled state of mind characterised by peace. An attitude that viewed the world with all its ups and downs with equanimity. A confident way of looking at life that was rooted in faith. That is a keen awareness and trust of the living Lord of the church. And Paul makes that connection himself when he writes in the first chapter here of joy in the faith. What Paul is communicating to these first century Philippian Christians and to us today is that we can know real joy and peace through putting our faith firmly in God. Now, if you read right through this letter in one go, and it won't take you long, you've probably got plenty of time now you've finished that box set of Columbo, uh, you'll notice how often Paul speaks of joy. And you'll see just how often that joy is linked with faith, or more particularly, linked to Jesus. Rejoice in the Lord. And it's something that we need to take to heart at all times, not just when we're isolated and ill. Indeed, there isn't really anywhere else to put it other than in God. The 17th century English poet and priest John Donne wrote, True joy is the earnest which we have of heaven. It is the treasure of the Lord (coughs) and therefore should be laid in a safe place and nothing of this world is safe to place it in. God is here and he is not silent. He has shown himself in Jesus. The occasion for those angels singing about the good news of great joy. We believe in him and we've felt his effect on our lives. Now I've said this before and I'll say it again. Being a Christian, being a follower of Jesus is brilliant. There's nothing to compare with it. And it's brilliant because you don't have to keep trying for it. God has saved you. God will keep you. God will watch over you for eternity as you spend it enjoying the benefits of the kingdom of God. Paul put up with all kinds of things during his life, from shipwreck to scourging, from rejection to misrepresentation. Yet he knew that God would not let him down in terms of his eternal destiny. Paul's a great example and a great source of inspiration to us. But we're not joyful because of that. We're joyful because of the one to whom Paul points us. The same source of joy for him and for us, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as I said, we're going to look a a bit more closely at this letter over the next few weeks. I hope it will help all of us to grasp that sense of real joy that we can have, despite the circumstances in which we find ourselves at the moment. Now, I know it's not easy, but I'd like to think that we'd all end up enjoying being a Christian even more than we do at the moment. And that maybe some of you listening this morning will discover the joy that is in Jesus for the very first time. Perhaps you've never really thought about it very much up until now. Maybe you're even one of those people who does think that Christians are boring and joyless. Well, give us the opportunity to show you otherwise. I want to finish with a few words from another Bible scholar, someone called James Denny, who wrote, There is not in the New Testament, from beginning to end, in the record of the original and genuine Christian life, a single word of despondency or gloom. It is the most buoyant, exhilarating and joyful book in the world. And no part of it more so than Paul's letter to the Philippians. (coughs) Now, part of that joy 
comes through having a sense of confidence in God and in our relationship with him. So let's reflect on that. We're going to listen to a song by our worship group. Once again, uh, it's been stitched together into an ensemble piece from individual parts recorded in their homes. But reflect on the possibility of real joy in Jesus as we listen to the music group playing I Am Who You Say I Am. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, his free. Yeah. 
I'm going to take a few moments now to remember and to pray for those who are in particular need at the moment. Some will be known to us, many won't be. But Colin Davis is going to lead us in our prayers of intercession this morning. So let's pray as Colin leads us. Let us pray. Father God, our world is broken, struggling under the burden of our sin and sinful ways. Help us now, we pray, as the whole world confronts the coronavirus pandemic, which is bringing us face to face with our own mortality and vulnerability daily. Lord, we ask you to protect the men and women throughout the world who are placing themselves at risk to care for and treat those suffering from the virus. They are doing so at great personal risk to themselves and sometimes at the cost of their own lives. Lord Jesus, you gave yourself so that we may have life and you taught us that one of your greatest commandments is to love our fellow man as we would be loved. It is often said that greater love has no one than they lay down their life for a friend. How much greater is the love shown by the doctors, nurses, carers, porters and health workers for the people in their care who are often strangers? Please take a moment to remember and pray for those people you know who are on the front line of this pandemic. Father, we pray that the leaders in all the countries of the world would honour and reflect the true service to their fellow man that these people are showing daily. Lord, we ask that leaders in all areas of life throughout the world, monarchs, presidents, prime ministers, members of national governments, local authority officials and religious leaders would learn that they are there to serve their people, not to build their own personal status, wealth and power. May they also come to know about Jesus Christ and truly accept him as their Lord and Saviour. Lord, let us not forget that our world is suffering in many other ways that we ask you to intercede in on behalf of the people involved. Ebola is still present in the Democratic Republic of Congo and health workers are working with local populations to contain this disease at the same time that the threat of COVID-19 is looming. Lord, keep them in the palm of your hand and build their strength as they fight both these diseases. Hatred and violence is still present in our world, Lord. We lift the people of Afrin city, Syria, to your care, as 40 people were killed in the truck bombing of the central market. We ask you to give comfort to the victims and their families, and we ask you to drive the hate from the hearts of the people who carried out the attack to be replaced with love for their fellow man through the power of your Holy Spirit. Father, we pray for the more than 50 million displaced people throughout the world, the vast majority of whom have been driven out of their homes and countries due to violent conflict. Father, in their need, bring the true hope of your salvation into their lives and also to the lives of the people responsible for the loss of their homes and homelands. Lord, help us to recognise why many of us are drawn to volunteer to help others in this pandemic. It is because we are made in your image and you are the very essence of love and community. Help people to search for you in the midst of this crisis, either to build on their existing Christian faith or to search for the answers that can only come from relationship with you. May we in this church serve as a source of those answers through the growing of disciples and the growth of evangelistic initiatives. Thus we will truly serve our community by bringing Christ to the centre of our city. Lord, guide our elders to keep you at the centre of their current deliberations 
to bring our focus here at Wade Street to meeting these core needs in our community. Help us all to recognise and believe that the greatest threat facing any of us in this world, broken because of our sin, is not to be given the opportunity of coming to know Jesus Christ, building a relationship with him and having the sure and certain hope of eternal life with him. Help us all to truly focus on showing Jesus Christ in us. Help us to be salt and light in our community, to show that through the salvation of Jesus Christ, our past has been forgiven, our present is given meaning, and our eternal future is secured in him. We pray that the whole world will have the opportunity to know you, Therefore, may those who have not heard your word, hear your word. Let those who have heard your word, understand your word through the power of the Holy Spirit. Let those who understand your word, believe your word. Let those who come to believe your word, bring it to those who have not yet heard it. And so may your kingdom grow. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour, we pray. So as we draw to the end uh, of this service, we're going to sing another song together. We've talked about looking for help from Jesus and about what we might discover in Philippians over the next few weeks. But maybe you need some help this morning. Maybe you can hear Jesus calling you today and you want to do something about it. Maybe you are someone who'd like someone to pray for you even. There's going to be some details on the screen at the end of this service if you do want to get in touch or if you'd like to be directed to something that could help. We can point you towards the online Alpha course maybe or we can put you in touch with someone who'd be prepared to talk to you or pray with you. But as we sing this song together, just take note of these words. Come today. There's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Jesus is calling you. Respond today.
So before our final prayer, as usual, just one or two quick announcements for you. Uh, firstly, again, thank you once more to Colin Bridle and James Cresswell for all the work that they put in to this morning's service and to the others who've taken part today in different ways. Secondly, the music that you hear at the beginning and end of these services is usually by people from our own congregation. And before the service this morning, you would have heard some music from Adrian Boucher. But the music at the end today, if you if you hang on at the end of the service, is by Gareth Davis Jones. Gareth should have been coming here in a couple of weeks' time to do a concert as part of a national tour, but sadly, obviously, that's had to be postponed until at least the autumn. But he's put out some of his songs on Vimeo as a collection called Songs for the Staying Home. Uh, and this song that we're going to hear this morning, uh, or that you'll hear at the end, is called All Things Come was written as a reflection on patience. Uh, it's the first track on his 2017 album, The Beauty and the Trouble. Uh, and Gareth says, I guess it has the distinction of being one of my hits. Well, it was played on BBC Radio 2 once and therefore qualifies. So you can listen to that and maybe you'll come along and see him later in the year. Thirdly, please keep sending in your items for praise and thanks. Uh, as well as any birthdays or anniversaries to be mentioned. If you send them to the vision at wadestreetchurch.co.uk address, they'll go straight to the person who needs to uh, put them into the service. And don't forget, if you or anyone you know needs any help or would like someone, as I said a few moments ago, to pray with you, there are folk in the church who are who have volunteered to, to step in and do whatever's needed. If you, if you can't get out, if you've got particular needs or, or whatever, please call me. If you're part of the church, you can call your house group leader or an elder, and we'll put you in touch with someone as soon as we can. Or you can email volunteers at wadestreetchurch.co.uk. The house groups are still operating, as you said, via various applications uh, such as Zoom and Skype material. For the groups that's based on the sermons will be on the church website and you can find out the contact details for those groups if you want to join one uh, via our website. If you're a regular worshipper with us and you'd like to continue to give financially you can do that electronically. Details are on Facebook or on the church news sheet or website or if you just want to put a bit of money aside each week and then bring it with you uh, when eventually we get back together again. Once again this morning, you can have a conversation over a cup of tea or coffee, which sadly you'll have to provide yourself uh, via our virtual refreshments on Zoom. There should be a, a link on Facebook, or you may have had one by email if you want to get involved in that. All being well, uh, we'll be back next Sunday with another YouTube service. As we said, uh, next week we'll be joining the nation in remembering that it's the 75th anniversary of VE Day. And please let other people know about this. We know there are many people who will sit and watch a, a service online who wouldn't normally come into a church building. Uh, as uh, we said last week, you get about 450 people each week viewing us uh, on, on YouTube. So tell your friends and neighbours, give them the link. They don't have to um, follow it, but uh, put the message out there. Let your friends and neighbours know that we're still here as a church. And if you know anyone who'd like to be part of this but doesn't have the internet or has difficulty getting onto it or whatever, we can let them have a, a DVD of the service if you let us know. If you're interested in what goes on at Wade Street Church, you'd like to find out more or about what we believe, what's behind all this, there'll be some contact details on the screen at the end of the service. But let's draw our worship to a close with some words of blessing. May the peace of the Lord go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you and all whom you love this day, this week and forevermore. Amen.